Let's do it at the same time. Okay. Hello, Hello everybody. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it at the same time. It's <laughs> yeah, really it's tough. tough. It's tough. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another <laughs> episode of the Anime Movie Podcast. We are your hosts. I am Joe. I'm Kat. And today we're talking about a new Netflix original anime, though I'm thinking it's a little dubious to call it a Netflix original anime because it Certain things don't add up when I look up this movie online. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. But we're talking about words bubble up like soda pop. It is directed by Kyohei Ishiguro. And it just came out on Netflix. And it's, you know, obviously a 2021 movie then. But everything that I look up says it's from 2020. So it's obviously from previous year. From previous year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as, a, as somebody who works in the TV industry, I haven't worked on a, with a lot of streaming platforms, so I mm. don't quite know what counts as an original for them or not. You know, you know, you assume that they they act like a network, so they're giving money to a production company to be able to do it. And there's, there's a chance that Netflix still funded it, that yeah. they still gave the production company the money to do it and it might have come out in Japanese Netflix in 2020 and then it's only coming out here in 2021. I don't know exactly. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. Like it maybe if maybe it came out in, on Japanese Netflix in 2020 and we were just waiting for a dub or something. Yeah. Cause I, I, you know, I think if it was, if it was made separately, then you can't, you can't really call it an original. I don't, but yeah. I don't, I don't know how they legally define that. Yeah. Nor I, this is a fun movie. It's cute. It's, um, I I had my doubts at first because I was uh, a little bit confused because they they're really not setting stuff up in a way that's very expository. Yeah. Um. And so it takes a little while to figure out what's going on with with some of these characters, but it's basically a teen romance. Mm-hmm. Um. There's a meet cute. There's uh. You know, it's generally fairly formulaic as far as sort of a, a rom-com goes yeah. teenage rom-com um and it's it's like a little quirky um and sweet yeah i don't know about you but the 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 story felt super familiar to me like i feel oh, like yeah. i've seen this exact same story somewhere else yeah i think um with certain thing things and, and themes kind of replaced but mm-hmm. it it's a it's a pretty classic sort of rom-com. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's very uh, quirky, very bright and vibrant. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I guess a little spoiler-free synopsis would be that uh, there are two main characters, our two love interests, basically, Cherry and Yuki. Well, Cherry and Smile. Cherry and or Smile. Or Sakura, Sakura and Yuki. Sakura and Yuki. <laughs> Um, Cherry is kind of a socially awkward person. He has a lot of anxiety about talking with people and, and speaking in public. So he just kind of goes about his days writing haikus and that's kind of how he communicates with people. And Smile slash Yuki is a popular live streamer, like on Twitch, like, well, this version's Twitch or like Instagram live or whatever. And she is very self-conscious about her buck teeth slash braces. So she wears a mask everywhere she goes, which is very ironic because, you know, her her screen name is Smile. And that's like kind of what she's known as. And she is always hiding her smile. So it is a chance encounter that these two meet and they uh, they get bumped into and have to like they, they ought to they accidentally swap phones and then they have to meet each other again. And then through that meeting, they get to know each other and the rest goes on into spoilerville. Yeah. I think that's about right. Um, both of these characters have some issues with communication. Mm-hmm. Smile is told to put her phone away at the dinner table because she's always on it. So she's not really engaging with, um, you know, the world in real life as it's happening now Mm -hmm. and of course um cherry has difficulty with with public speaking and wears headphones that actually aren't connected to anything just because he he doesn't want to have to deal with talking because the social anxiety is so strong um which which is a great tactic it's one that i've employed 
several times <laughs> in life especially when I was living in New York I'd get on the subway and just have headphones in and not listening to anything because I did not want anybody talking to me. Try it. No one will talk to you. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. I mean, people still will. Like if you go to the gym and you have headphones on, people will still sometimes like. Yeah. Well, then yeah. they do the yeah. awkward thing of like. <laughs> yeah. Um, the animation in this is pretty interesting. It a lot of the motion movement of the characters feels hand drawn. Mm. I'd be shocked if it was. Most of this stuff is is a CG these days. Yeah. Um, but there's something about it that wasn't fluid the way a lot of CG stuff is. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the way that the characters move is very choppy. Like it's not fluid. It's not smooth it's very choppy and then there is a lot of cg like spliced in there and it is very apparent and a lot of the backgrounds feel very computer generated mm -hmm. um it has a lot of block coloring there's some things that are quite abstract there's some very cute abstractions that yeah. i really liked when street lights come on you kind of have it's almost like there's tissue paper one over the other so that the middle part looks like a perfect star and mm -hmm. then one layer out it looks a little bit more translucent and one layer out it's even even more translucent but it looks like paper cutouts almost yeah and there's also a lot of like stars in this like it's it's a, like a common animation theme throughout this movie it's just just like stars all over the place and like perfect stars like you see in you know on kids middle school notebook yeah you see it on um smile's phone and you see it on the wall of her and her two siblings room mm -hmm. as well they have it as kind of like wallpaper so yeah that definitely does come up as a pattern um but yeah I, I was saying to you while we were watching the movie too but a lot of this animation and the brightness and the kind of abstract stuff really reminded me of the netflix series great pretender which i'm a big fan of i thought it was really good and i thought that the animation in that show was really unique and it was unlike anything i'd seen before in anime and then this kind of reminded me of that with all the brightness and all of the color and all of the abstract stuff going on i thought it was really cool i thought that the animation was very interesting yeah and i i said that there was a couple of scenes that kind of reminded me of um of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Mm -hmm. And then you said, I think Great Pretender. And I was like, you're right. That is, <laughs> it, it's closer to that. But there there still are some like interesting color choices mm -hmm. and, and some things that you would potentially see in the background of, of Jojo as well. Yeah. And I know in Jojo, went on the fourth Jojo slash season three with Josuke Higashikata, it has a very unique like sky coloring. And I could see that how you would think that, uh, this was similar to that even. And even like sometimes the shadows were a different color on the characters. Like I remember one specifically uh, on Cherry, his shadow was like colored pink, mm. which was interesting. And uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of odd coloring. It's very, it's a bold choice, but one that I approve of. <laughs> yeah, I liked it. And I thought that um, while it was bright colors, it wasn't so bright that it got overwhelming. Yeah, it didn't like give me a headache or anything. It never like went into pastels exactly, mm -hmm. but it was it was like it was like bright colors, but almost like slightly muted versions of those bright colors. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense, um, you know, and you'd see like a big field of some kind, uh, maybe some kind of farming field, and um, it would it'd be like one solid green, and then it would kind of have like a stripe or two of some other green. So that yeah. was like very color block. Um, yeah, so I thought that the animation was pretty fun. Um, I thought that 50% of the time the music didn't really fit for me. There was some, they went with this style that was kind of like plinky plonky EDM, mm -hmm. but sometimes, you know, there's, there's a scene in the beginning where, where it's like some kind of adventure and like there's things happening and, you know, stuff flying. And it was like, plink, 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 
like, I was like, this isn't the right music for this scene. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember specifically you were like, you said it while we were watching. You're like, this doesn't fit. I'm like, no. <laughs> but then there was, you know, an, an, another couple of times where I was like, oh, this song's really nice. This is great. But yeah, and a lot of the movie kind of hinges on one specific song that the characters are trying to figure out the mystery of. And uh, I thought that song was great. I thought yeah. a lot, some of the plinky plonky stuff was like fine. Like it didn't blow me away, but it didn't bother me as much as it bothered you, I guess. Uh, like, especially in that beginning scene, like I, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I won't be looking up this soundtrack anytime soon, but no. it wasn't offensive to me. This film feels like it was based off of a novel. You know, it's so new that there isn't a ton of information about it, but I didn't see anything about it being based off a novel, but it feels like a young adult novel. Um, and there's there's no real sort of magical elements to it. It's very much, you know, a movie that, you know, has these like coincidences in a very movie way, but nothing that goes past like, oh, I can't believe that we've just discovered that blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and so it feels like something I might have read when I was like 12. Yeah. Do you think that they're going to eventually make a live action version of this movie? Because I feel like, I mean, there's nothing that suggests it couldn't be. If it was wildly popular, maybe. But um, I, d I wouldn't see a reason to make a live action version of it. I, I feel like this movie exists somewhere else with some slightly different characters and slightly different scenarios. And I don't know that we need it. Yeah. It seemed kind of like uh like garden state to me. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't it, wasn't like the fault in our stars. Some kind of similar to this. I didn't, I didn't watch it, but I think that that one, somebody has cancer and they're dying as a rom-com. Yeah. I mean, rom -com. I mean, I read the book. I, I didn't watch the movie. Uh -huh. Um, and it's really sad. So, yeah, so it's, it's hard for me to call it a rom-com, but it has some... There's some parts of this that are very sad or at yeah. least emotionally gripping. Sure. Like, I got kind of, like, invested in some of the stuff, and I was in my feels every once in a while. I cried. You did? Yeah. I didn't notice. <laughs> I have to hide it from you. Ha-ha. <laughs> I was, like, embarrassed. It's because if, if Kat cries in front of me, I just point at her and I go, Look at you! <laughs> You're crying! <laughs> <laughs> it's true and then he flicks me on the nose it's really mean <laughs> nerd <laughs> <laughs> um some of the voice i mean i guess like it's because of the adr so they had to be really choppy with their voices too and also the social anxiety too yeah some of the the, the voice performances were a little they bothered me a little bit but I also don't, you know, I, I don't know that many people with like social anxiety to this degree. So I don't know if that's like accurate or something. I think they're also trying to, you know, fit sort of a language culturally that doesn't quite fit with another. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, in, in anime, it's super common for the sort of nonverbal sighs and, and moans and these these noises that um i don't know if japanese people make or if that's that's very normal or if it's just specifically like something designed for anime yeah. um but it's not something that you see in you know american animation very often um you know they're either talking or not <laughs> <laughs> i mean of course you get these like hmm you know but yeah. you don't you don't get these like yeah the anime gasps as i call them yeah <gasps> but you know we had we had entire you know the first time we we're introduced to smile who's our, our female lead um she's looking at herself in the in the mirror and and you're starting to learn that she has braces and that she um, feels self-conscious about the the buck teeth and um she's on screen for a while and she makes so many noises <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and so I think that there's certain speeches in sort of speech patterns in speaking Japanese that, um, you know, ADR can be a little challenging for. 
And yeah. I think that 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 was espe- especially hard for like Cherry mm, in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there are certain times where Cherry's like, I think we should go to the mall. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, dude. <laughs> and I get that, you know, he's supposed to be socially, uh, have some anxiety and he's having a difficulty talking to people. And I understand that. But uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of gets a little choppy at times. But yeah, I thought the the voice performances otherwise were pretty good. Yeah, I did think some of the random characters who only have a couple of lines, some of their voices were absurd. Um, yeah. But it kind of made it fun. It was it was fun and quirky. It didn't it didn't totally throw me. Yeah, I mean, there's an old man character in this named Mister Fujiyama who. 80% of his dialogue is just like screamed at the top of his lungs because <laughs> he's, I guess, because he's hard of hearing or something. But man, did that get old really quick to me. Yeah, I think they could have used that joke a little less. Yeah. Um, and there's also times where he seemed to mumble something. And it was like, what? I didn't understand yeah. what he just said. And then he'll scream. And it's like, I didn't understand what he said because he was screaming this time. Um Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think we could spoil this. Move into Spoilerville? Yeah. They wouldn't spoil this, right? Oh, God! They wouldn't spoil this, right? No spoilers! Spoiler talk, spoiler talk, anime movie podcast, spoiler talk. All right, so now we are in Spoilerville. So first thing that I would like to have spoiled here is which part made you cry? Um, I actually cried twice. Okay. I cried when the old man started. Cr- oh, it just started welling up. <laughs> no, stop it, feel. Nerd. <laughs> You're not supposed to see me like this. <laughs> um, I cried when Mr. Fujiyama started crying when he was getting kind of incoherent. Um. Mr. Fujiyama has has lost this record, mm-hmm. and <laughs> I'm saying this like you don't know, but Mr. Fujiyama's Fujiyama's lost this record, and he carries this record sleeve around. And Cherry works at what seems like a senior daycare center. Yeah. Um, and and he's only there because his mom had hurt his hurt her back, and she was working there before, and and he just filled in for her. Yeah. Which we can talk about later because that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, what qualifications does this boy have that is you know, just hereditary? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so he's spending a decent amount of time with Mr. Fujiyama, uh, who keeps going on about not being able to find this record. And it, and it kind of feels like maybe he's senile. You're not really sure. Um, then one day Cherry takes him home um, and it's, you know, Fujiyama records. And mm-hmm. so it turns out he owns this record store and then he's talking about how he's devastated that he can't find it because there's something that he can't remember, but he can't let himself forget. And it just like, it took me back to like watching my grandma go through dementia mm. and like how heartbreaking that was. And, you know, you learn that, that it, it was, it's this record of his wife singing, mm-hmm. you know, and then of course that made it even sadder. And it was yeah. just like, my heart, please yeah. stop. I can't. <laughs> yeah. And we also find out that his wife has been dead for, you know, seems like 40 ish years or something. Like yeah. She died when, so we also meet Fujiyama's daughter who tells us that, uh, tells us me and you that her mom died when she was like really young so she doesn't even really remember her. So the mom has been dead slash Fujiyama's wife has been dead for, it seems like at least 30 years. Yeah. It's been a long, long time. Um, so yeah, just that idea that he, he knows that he can't forget, but it's like, he's not quite sure what he's supposed to remember. He just need, knows that he needs to find this. Oh God. <laughs> um, and I actually, I actually got a bit teary in in the end when when Cherry is is saying all the the haikus that he's been writing throughout the the film, yeah. and it and it turns into this string of of haikus that's just like, 
a subtle but really beautiful kind of like love letter to to smile and and i was like this this is so lame in some in so many ways <laughs> but like it's actually really really sweet and it's very 10 things i hate about you um yeah that sort of final poem but and you're like oh just have the main character read a poem sure but they're like but it's actually really good yeah that's what i was gonna say too is like i feel like the haikus in this are pretty good like i'm usually the first person to be like uh haiku's so lame or whatever um but i was like that's actually pretty clever haiku like the way that he's using his words is very clever and yeah at the end when he's reading all of the haikus that he's written since he's met smile they all form kind of like a one long story as yeah. opposed to like, you know, just a haiku, which is really short. Like when you put all of the ones that he had written since they met together, it kind of is like a chronicle of their relationship from the start to where they are at this point. Yeah. And it's it's really well done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I, I wrote a ton of poetry um, from the age of 12 until, you know, maybe 25. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, a lot of the earlier stuff is, is very embarrassing <laughs> to go back to. <laughs> I'd be ashamed if anybody found it. I'd be so embarrassed. We're looking for it after the podcast. <laughs> Don't worry. For our Patreon viewers. The Patreon that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> <laughs> or does it? <laughs> and And haiku is one of the kind of simplest forms of poetry. You don't have to think very hard about the meter Mm -hmm. um so you don't have to think about the rhythm of the way that the words are said and and then you also don't have to think about having to rhyme the ends of lines or you know use alliteration which is technically rhyming the beginning of Mm -hmm. of a word um and that becomes a really big puzzle when you're writing poetry to be able to have it still make sense have this this certain rhythm and and have uh, the rhyming. And then, you know, there's a lot of freestyle poetry where you kind of lose a lot of that. But with, with haiku, it's, it's very structured, but it's structured um, in terms of the number of syllables that you have for each line. And, and each, each is like three lines long, Mm -hmm. but then you can have a longer string of, of, you know, many, many haikus. And some of them just almost seem to make no sense because, you know, there's there's you know, reasons culturally why when it's translated from Japanese into English, when it's very confusing in, in English. Um, but but also because you're limited to it being so short, um, sometimes it can it can be a bit of a, of a brain teaser. But I really liked the way they weaved in this um, sort of haiku dictionary that he had as part of his, in, you know, inside of his like phone wallet and that, that his, I guess he was borrowing from his dad. Mm-hmm. Cause at first I was just like, is he trying to learn Japanese? Is he foreign? Like, why does he have a dictionary inside of his phone wallet? Um, and then later we actually see him kind of use it. And, and so it, it sort of defines the way words are used um commonly how their their meaning can can shift and change and the way they're used in haikus yeah which i found really interesting i just had no idea that was a thing i think they called it a saijiki nah, you're asking the wrong guy <laughs> <laughs> i also enjoyed like how they w- wove the haikus in throughout the story to kind of give you an update about what's going on because as he's writing the haikus his buddy is like spray painting them all over the place. And so as he's writing like the new haiku about, you know, his, what we find out later to be like kind of his confession of like for smile, the, the new haikus are like graffiti throughout the city, which I thought was pretty cool because like his, his buddy is, would see his haikus on social media and then he'd be like, Oh cool. I like that. And then he uses his haikus as a means to like teach him how to write Japanese and he's always like fucking it up mm-hmm. like the kid is always like misspelling things and but yeah like as the story progresses you get a sense of like how cherry feels and you see it on through the graffiti and like this is where we're at in the story now it's kind of like broken up into chapters based on which haiku has been written i felt like yeah i think that's true and you know at the beginning um he's kind of speaking in in haikus and it's 
you're not sure what's going on yet. So Mm -hmm. you're just like, what's happening? (laughs) Um, But I think one thing that's really effective about that is that it's, it's said that he has trouble communicating, but he has this gift for, for writing, writing haikus. And that's a way that comes really easily for, for him to express himself. And, you know, it's, it's hard to have somebody that socially anxious sometimes or somebody who's always ha- has their head down, always has headphones on as a character in a film to relate to. You know, and some, sometimes they can do like, oh, I can empathize with that character who's obviously feeling socially anxious. I felt that way before. Loads of characters are awkward. But you don't get them being quite that quiet and quite that closed off. Mm-hmm. You might see them like that around other people, but then when they're on their own, you know, they're like, oh, why am I always like that? You know, they kind of have this like extroverted self around only themselves. Yeah. Um, but in this one, they don't have that. And it would be hard, I think, to care about this character or really kind of feel connected to him until you start hearing his haikus. And when, when you they start to make more sense and you can understand how they're relating to how he feels, you start to feel for him. So I think that, you know, not only is that his character within the film world, but I think that that's also his character to the audience. Yeah. It was really well done. I liked his characterization was so well done. And again, at the, at the beginning, like you said, I was kind of like, how am I going to get into this? Like, this is kind of rough. But then as the movie progressed, I was like, okay, I really started to like feel for him and like him. And yeah, they really grew him very nicely throughout the, you know, the hour and a half movie that this is. Yeah. And I like how you, how you said his um, confession of like, because this doesn't go to that, like, I love you place. Mm -hmm. And I think that especially with them being teenagers and them seeming to have known each other for four or five weeks, even though they've kind of, you know, now they're, they're both working in this center together and um, then they, decide that it's really important that they find this this record now that Fujiyama is, is so much older and that he seems unwell. Um, they're like, we need to find this. And so they have this sort of common goal and they're spending a lot of time together. The movie still doesn't take it to the like, well, so they've obviously fallen in love. Yeah. You know? It's just this like, it's more realistic with how you know relationships start. Yeah, I enjoy that too because a lot of times in the anime that we watch, it's it's very much like out of nowhere, a side character will be like, you're in love with him, aren't you? And it's like that love was so unearned. <laughs> but this felt like the like was definitely earned. Like they've been working together at, at, on this project for the record and then in like an actual like old folks home setting. Like they've been together a lot. And it, it's kind of like a odd couple too because she's so outgoing on social media and has millions of followers or thousands of followers according to uh cherry's friend who like recognizes her as a a social media celebrity or whatever and then there's cherry who just posts his haikus and he's only got four followers and two of them are his friends one of them is like a bot and one of the other one is his mom and he's kind of like mom stop liking all my posts and she's like if i don't like them no one will it's like brutal, brutal, brutal roast mom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was a little shocked. I mean, mom I mean, woke she's... up that morning and chose violence. <laughs> she absolutely did. She woke up every morning and chose violence. <laughs> um, yes. And, you know, I was just thinking that at the end of this film, um, one thing that kind of breaks away from, from formula as far as the classic cis hetero normative um, rom-com goes is that you almost always have uh, the male character doing some kind of grand gesture for the female character and then that you know earns her affection back after you know he's fucked something up and whatever but in this film there's a grand gesture from each of them Mm -hmm. to the other one and that's really really nice yeah you know and you use you and a lot of the things in this don't come from out of nowhere there's some there's always set up for some of these things so we've seen them practicing this dance with the seniors for um like as 
like to this folk music Mm -hmm. and they're planning on performing at this sort of fireworks show that that's going to happen there's some kind of a a festival or something i don't know if it's a local thing um yeah i think it's just like a local town festival that's going on yeah and you know they find a copy of of this record that was lost behind a cupboard but also earlier while um you know cherry is moving he finds something behind a a cupboard and Mm. and so you have this nice like oh everything's behind a cupboard yeah something (laughs) (laughs) like oh i was just found something like what if i look behind here and it's not the one that fujiyama had originally had in in the record sleeve he's holding um and it and it's been warped yeah and they're gonna try and and play it and um then of course smile notices that it's warped and then joe called this yep as soon as she like brought it out and she was uh like handling it without the sleeve and she was just kind of like cavalier with how she was holding it i was like she's definitely gonna break this record this record is definitely getting broken and it didn't get broken in the way that i thought it was originally we're gonna get broken but uh so basically she asks Cherry, if if uh, he will watch the fireworks with her at the festival, but Cherry will be unable to make it to the fireworks because on the day of the fireworks festival, he's going to be moving, which he hasn't told Smile slash Yuki yet. He's just kind of been keeping it secret. It seems like he's kind of in denial and he doesn't want to accept that it's going to happen. So he's kind of conflicted like, oh, do I tell her now? And then he's just kind of like, oh, let's just go play the record. And he runs inside and this is when Smile notices that the record is warped. And she's like, well, let me try and uh, like fix this. And she just starts pressing it down on the ground. And uh, as that was happening, Kat was like, oh, no, don't, don't. And then when it's when the record snapped, you jumped like it was like a jump scare from a horror film. (laughs) I absolutely did. And here's the thing is that, you know, you called it as soon as it was out of the sleeve and in her hands. And Mm -hmm. you were like, oh, she's going to break it. And I was like. No, they worked so hard to find they that they wouldn't do that. It's been days that they've been looking for days. this record. It's been literal days going through every record in that record shop. And then even when she was like starting to kind of like press down, I was like, no, she's going to almost do it. And then it's not. And this is just going to, this is just supposed to make us nervous. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And then, and then it happened. And yeah, I actually jumped yeah. at the sound of that, that <laughs> breaking. Cause I just put myself in her shoes and mm-hmm. I was just like the amount of, of bad feelings <laughs> that that would bring up is just, it's too much. Yeah. And like, I, you know, I, I kind of want to call bullshit on it breaking like that like i don't think it would just snap into a it broke up into like 15 pieces like a like a piece of glass like i don't think that a record would break like that. no and initially initially when she does it it seems to only break in like two places Mm -hmm. um but and that and that whole the animation of that of that scene of of her going through all the feelings and realizations of what just happened is actually very very funny yeah um but the situation very unfunny very unfunny <laughs> terrible that's actually when i started to get a little teared up when she's trying to put the record back together it just keeps falling apart oh i i, I yeah that's that was when i was just like too. oh man this is so sad to watch because you know you obviously know she feels so bad she's potentially robbed this guy of hearing his wife's I've voice never again. hearing his dead wife's voice again. Something that he's been looking for for years. He's been carrying around this record sleeve everywhere he goes. It's his last like memories of her. And she was responsible for like breaking his opportunity to do that. And it's just like oh, all of the guilt. And you know, you see her trying to glue it together and she's just so impatient with it because she wants it to work so bad and then it's not working. It keeps falling apart. And then she starts to, you know, cry and that's when I was just like, man, that has to feel so bad. And I started to feel very bad for her. Like, it was so sad to me. It was awful. And so on on one side, you see a, a picture of the wife who also had buck teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people like... in this movie, buck teeth. <laughs> the father, Smile's father, buck yeah. teeth. The Miss Fujiyama, buck teeth. A lot of buck teeth people in see. here. I think the writer has buck teeth maybe maybe he's british 
<laughs> Zing. Wow. Gotcha, fucking Brits. Take that, David Fagiani. <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> David Fagiani, great fan of the show. Shout out. Listen to his episode that we did pork over also. Who doesn't have buck teeth? <laughs> He's British. <laughs> David, your teeth are lovely. Check out his podcast too. Escape Goats? Escape Goats. Escape Goat Podcast. Boom. The Escape Goat Podcast. Check it out. Um, God, that derailed me. <laughs> Sorry. I had to give a, a, an apology plug. Sure. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And then, and then Smile presents the finally glued back together record and yeah. that kind of broke my heart too <laughs> um no yeah as soon as she gave it back to him uh and you see all of the glue like sticking out of it i was like oh they're gonna have a real rough time trying to play that record <laughs> <laughs> just skipping all the time <laughs> then again joe you called it you saw on on the wall of the this senior daycare center that mm -hmm. turns out they made that record into a clock yeah and i've seen records being made into clocks before so i kind of recognize it as a thing that people do and but when we saw the back side of the the b side of the record where it wasn't a picture of the wife it was a picture of the um the the festival with the fireworks and as soon as they were inspecting the posters earlier in the movie in the mall about the festival with the fireworks, I was like, that's going to come into play with something later. And then we see that the clock has the same uh, B-side as the record. And I was like, oh, that's the record on the on the wall on the, with the clock. And I remember you were kind of like, wait, what? Oh, yeah, that is the same picture. I was like, yeah, it's, this is how it's going to end. I think they, they did a really good job of, of showing that on the wall so that even to up to the last moment, it was giving the audience the chance to see it before yeah. it was said, which I think is nice because I think audiences like when they have that chance to, to be like, oh, look at that thing before it tells me, you know? You know, this is going to be like a weird comparison, but I feel like watching this movie is kind of similar to like watching a horror movie where you're looking at all the clues in the background to see if there's something that you're missing because there is a lot of clues in the background about what's going to happen there's a lot of setup there's a lot of things that pay off and like from earlier in the film yeah it's it's a, the perfect movie <laughs> no it's it's very inner it's very well set up like that like yeah. I, I like that a lot like there's a lot of things that you can see and be like, oh, that's going to come into play later. Or you might not even realize it's going to come into play later, but it does. And it, it's very cool. Yeah, I agree. And I think one of the reasons why this feels like a novel to me is that, you know, both of our um, protagonists, they have two friends. And, you know, that there's always that like trio mm -hmm. thing going on. But each of their sort of friends have a really well thought out character and personality and has their own thing going on. And it, it's the sort of thing where I feel like if you were reading the novel, you would be learning so much more about those characters and there'd be a reason why there's so much thought behind who they are and what they're like. Um, but here we only get these like really small snippets of these people, but there's still time in an effort and thought put into well, what kind of people they are. And and I, I love that. I think that um, it makes it so much more fun to watch when every every character is, is well thought out. Yeah, and it's even more impressive because it's only, you know, an hour and 25, hour 20 minutes. Like, yeah. they get a lot of characterization in. They set up everything really well. And it's not a long movie. Like, no. some of the movies that we watch, you know, two hours long, hour 45 minutes. But this one really got all the information in they paid off a ton of stuff and uh, wrapped it up with a bow really nicely you know who loves 90 minute movies is it david fagiani it's david fagiani Jake Goats <laughs> podcast david fagiani <laughs> he loves a 90 minute movie he thinks that's the right amount of time and i, th I think you're right it's a good amount of time it's good it's perfect You'd probably like this we should have had him on <laughs> yeah we should have had him on <laughs> um did you tear up at all when uh, you got to see Mr. Fujiyama listen to his wife's record for the first time? I'm not cheering. 
anymore. <laughs> You're the nerd. No, I literally, I had an, I ate some nuts and it stuck in the back of my throat. He's right really sad right now. <laughs> he's, just, he's getting really emotional. He's so <clears throat> in his feels right now. It's Fujiyama. It's Fujiyama. Did you tear up at the part where... <laughs> Um, Actually, I feel like that part was the one that I didn't tear up, at, like really at all. Yeah, I mean, I think I got you know a little emotional swell of of like that's really sweet and nice, um, and I I think it it acts as like the the zamboni on the ice rink, just slicking it up. You know, the zamboni machine. No, yeah, I, you lost me with that metaphor but you know what this is, well I'm, I'm still i'm still oh you're in the middle of the metaphor. i'm in the middle okay. of it yeah okay. yeah i know what a zamboni is yeah. okay so the zamboni goes across the ice smooths it over and then when you get onto the ice you slip right into it mm. you know so i think that he was the the emotional zamboni okay. going into that scene and then cherry actually getting up and saying all those haikus was when you just you just slide right through into emotional vill. Okay, it, it is funny because we we get like kind of the mix of emotions because Mr. Fujiyama is supposed to be like really taking in this song that he hasn't heard in years, and you know it, it's it's his memories of his wife, and we get a lovely, lovely montage of their life together. It was very nice, very beautiful, and then we get the immediate like comedic break of him screaming at cherry to like he screams like a haiku at cherry that's basically telling him to like sack up and tell the girl your feelings or something yeah i don't i don't think it is too i don't think he sees cherries there i think he does i don't think he sees him i think he knows he's there <laughs> okay. why else would he be saying the haiku he said random haikus at other times, too. But they were related to things that were going on. Sure. And it could also be that, that moment where somebody just goes, you should tell the people that you feel things about, how you feel about them while they're still around, mm. you know, while he's remember remembering his you wife. You die tomorrow. Yeah, that sort of thing. I'm okay with either. <laughs> I'm, I'm completely comfortable with both options. Um but you know it occurred to me you know that the ending is so is so sweet and you see smile looking up and you know she she wells up and then she takes her mask off and she gives a really big smile with her buck teeth and braces um and you know after the credits you you see a little um sort of scene it almost looks like a gif because it kind of um repeats it's kind of um like a silhouette. Yeah, it's a silhouette, but I just couldn't remember the word for a loop. Mm. I couldn't remember the word loop. Jesus. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Cat Fujiyama over here. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes your words hurt. <laughs> Most of the time my words hurt. <laughs> But we see that that they get get smooching in the in the silhouettes, and you see sort of fireworks in the background and all of that, and it's 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 really nice. But he still like forced his parents to stop the car while they were driving away to move to another place. Mm -hmm. He's like, I forgot something, and you know, goes goes running back. And the reason why he's going running back is because of the grand gesture that smile does does for him which i i don't know where i got derailed earlier but i was gonna gonna say that the, the grand gesture that she does for him is live streaming playing that that music for mr fujiyama while he's part of this group that's that's dancing at the at the festival instead of playing the familiar folk music yeah. and so that was her grand gesture and then you know he goes running back and then delivers his grand gesture to her which is which is saying the haikus but he's moving yeah you know he's still going to have to like yeah, it's over he's still going to have to move yeah they they have a smooch underneath the the fireworks and then and then he's moving and you know i think that's one of those really sad things that that happen in 
kids' lives because they that's something they have zero control over. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and there's reasons why as an adult you might have to move and it's not your choice and you don't want to and you have to leave people that, you know, you care about. Um, but for the most part, those are because there's an opportunity somewhere else. There's something else going. So there's it's kind of this like bittersweet thing. Yeah, I... I can relate. Like I had to change schools when I was in elementary school and like, I didn't like my new school. I, I didn't, you know, it was harder to make friends there. Um, so I feel for Cherry and, uh, but I also feel, uh, for his parents because he just got out of the car and they're just left on the side of the road wondering what the fuck's going on. Like, <laughs> yeah. What did was, they do? Did they keep driving? What do you I think? No idea. <laughs> They probably went back to the house and he wasn't there. And they're like, what, where is he? He's filing a missing persons report. Like as they're driving away. Well, he's making out with yeah, a babe. Yeah, right. <laughs> as they're driving to go to their new home, uh, Cherry just is like, stop the car. I forgot something. I just was thinking about my parents. My parents would never stop the car. They And if, they, if I was like, I forgot something, they'd be like, well, just drive back. And that would have been the end. We would have never had the end of this movie <laughs> if people acted like my parents acted. I think if I freaked out and was like, Dad, stop the car, stop the car. I think he probably would because he'd think it was an emergency. Yeah. And okay, then yeah. I could like tuck and roll out of the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picturing you tucking and rolling at like a stopped car. <laughs> just so unnecessary. <laughs> That's that's what I would do in my movie. Yeah. Just to make it a little bit more dramatic, you know? I think the one thing that we've forgotten to mention about this movie is just how fucking cool Cherry and Smile's hangouts are. Oh, their hangout spaces are really cool. Their hangout spaces are so dope. Cherry's is on top, is on like the roof of a mall, and it's got like a balloon uh, what is it? What are they called? Garland type thing on it. And there's a bunch of mannequins. It's kind of a lot of found objects, but him and his two friends have, have made this, this kind of, and it's, it's not, it's not really a man cave, but like, a, it's like a tree house, but no tree. Yeah. Like a clubhouse on top of a mall. Open air clubhouse, yeah. rooftop clubhouse. I liked it a lot. I wish I had something like that when I was a kid. It's real. I would, I would do that now. I would go there now. <laughs> If there was, if you so set up, kids, it's me. <laughs> I'm not it's saying I would be there with children, you weirdo. <laughs> What's up, kids? It's Aunt Cat. <laughs> Gross. Get out of here. Um, but if there was a rooftop, like a quirky rooftop hangout where you could just go and and chill, and there'd be um, like a hammock video games yeah i wouldn't even need the video games just okay. you know a little shade just a shade and a hammock balloons would be good balloons i was little, into the maybe balloons. Some dressed up mannequins dressed up mannequins i like it i like it well yeah his hangout was cool some yoga smiles mat. smiles mm -hmm. was cool it was very tech savvy she had a computer with like 18 monitors which was <laughs> like insane there were three there were not three I, there were not, I will make you rewatch this. There was like at least seven, <laughs> at least seven. Um, basically her, her and her two sisters share this loft space, but the loft space is huge. Mm -hmm. So, um, they're able to have their kind of their rooms quite separate from each other. So they have their, their space and that it's has, you know, whatever design that they, they like. Um, and you know, one of them's on the bottom floor and two of them are on the top floor, but kind of opposite ends of it. And then in the center of it, there is a desk and there's several monitors around the desk and it looks like they kind of have it separated into each of their different sort of desk spaces as mm. well. And then it has like, so like floor to ceiling windows that like looked out on a garden. I was just like, this is such a fucking cool space. Yeah. I would love this as well yeah it was all very cool i was jealous of all of their like living situations <laughs> parents must be loaded yeah i mean in the the dining room looked really really humble but <laughs> yeah. but that space looked looked absolutely massive and very very cool yeah 
I'm sure if I saw this when I was younger, I would have, I've been like, I need that. I need all of these things. I need that star wall wallpaper bad. I need this, this love, this like, <laughs> this strong like that's based around poetry. Oh yeah. And I need, I need this loft. I need all of those screens. I am going to go paint my wall with stars. Mm hmm. I think I would have gotten obsessed with this movie. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it's good. Yeah. Should we crank our amps or is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I think I think let's let's do it. I'd love it if you went first. Sure. I gotta get this fucking nut in the back of my mouth. I gotta get it out. You guys he's getting emotional <sighs> again. I'm getting emotional cranking my amp. Ugh. <sighs> So I'm going to give it a 9 out of 11. I really enjoyed it. I, you know, when, when it started, I didn't think it was going to be as good as it got. But like like I said, like they set up things. They pay them all off. It's a very kind of straightforward plot. I like the poetry in it, which is crazy to me. Like, you know, I usually That's don't. shocking to me, too. Yeah, I mean, I thought as he was writing the haikus throughout the movie, they were clever. Like his his wordplay was pretty good. And then at the end, when he reads them all in a row, as if it's like one long poem, I was like, even that was like getting a s set up in order to make it pay off at the end because it was all one long fluid poem, it seemed. And yeah, I really liked the story with Mr. Mr. Fujiyama. It was, it was good. It got me in the feels at certain points. So... Yeah, it was pretty fucking good. Uh, you guys, you can still hear the, the feels in his voice. Yeah, you can still feel it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> my feels are overstepping onto your cranking. <clears throat> there we go. And, you know, I just realized as you were saying that, that even him saying the haikus aloud to her in the end is is a payoff from a setup earlier. And it's not just, you know, the, the payoff of all of those haikus, seeing those written around the city and seeing him write them and, and come up with them and all of that. But also, you know, he was asked to stand up and read in front of the seniors, like his, his poem, and he completely shut down. Yeah. And that was so hard for him. And the woman who had asked him to, to say them aloud, um, you know, she said that sometimes things can only really truly be expressed you know out loud and mm -hmm. not written and and he was like why can't it all just like be written this is a written medium <laughs> like haikus are not meant to be said aloud you know and then it's like he realizes oh i need to say things i can't just write them or make assumptions or not tell somebody like you need to say it <sighs> which is great um i'm i'm going with an 8.5 okay and you know a lot of a lot of similar reasons i love i love the way that everything is is set up and paid off just absolutely everything um which makes for a really cohesive story mm -hmm. um i think i think any of some of the downfalls for me is i would have liked to have known what was going on in the movie earlier yeah I'd like a little bit more information. I like the, you know, show don't tell thing. But I think sometimes in the beginning you need just a little <laughs> a little extra nudge. Um because I spent the first like 20 minutes being a little like I don't know how I feel about this yet. Um and I could have been enjoying it for the whole time. You know? Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> I just remember that there was a a baby crawling race. Oh yeah, yeah, and even that got paid off. It it was part of like one of his haikus later on. Yeah, so good. So good. Yeah. But yeah, I think my detriments to it, the what reason that I knocked two off of it is for the same thing. Like at the beginning of the movie, I was like, oh, this is just gonna be some kind of like weird slice of life thing. Yeah, and I think that um, I could have liked the music a little more. I kind of actually wanted to see a little bit more of you know, the friends and learn mm. a bit more about, um, her sisters. And I guess you couldn't keep the movie at 90 minutes and the perfect movie time, according to David Fagiani. And he's not wrong. Um, but you know, and, and there was a, a, a character that was, uh, Mr. Fujiyama's like grandson, I guess. 
he could have lost him as a character and nothing yeah. would have really... What did it say on his shirt? Like Trouble Boy or Tough something? Tough Boy. Tough Boy. And then there was the other girl that said like Skeleton Girl. Skeleton or Girl, yeah. And that's that's one of those things that makes it feel like it's based on either a manga or a novel because that kind of character you would have in, in a novel and, um, and you might have t- more time to explore or have him pop up occasionally and, and be important. Um, and in, in a movie, it's kind of like, did you need him though? Yeah. You know, um, although I did enjoy the cat that always, <laughs> almost across his shoulder and would yeah, like, always in front of the fan, always in front of the fan when it was hot and stuff like that. Um, so I really like this movie. I think, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, it's, it's not one where I'm like, I can't wait to watch this again, or I can't wait to recommend this to somebody else. I don't really know who I would, who I know who would like really enjoy this. Um, but I totally enjoyed watching it. I think that people that would enjoy, like I would totally recommend it to people if they enjoyed like your name, weathering with you or a silent voice even. Okay. Like just speaking strictly from anime, but I mean, otherwise, you know, Garden State, like I said earlier, Fault in Our Stars, I guess. I don't know. I never saw that movie. Ten Things I Hate About You. Never saw that one either. But uh, yeah, I, w- I would totally recommend it. Uh, uh, if you're like into rom-coms, I think it's a pretty strong rom-com. rom-com. Yeah. And the, and the one big difference, I think, between this and, and most rom-coms is that most rom-coms have some kind of event where the love interest gets genuinely really angry mm. at the at the the person who's you know interested in them um and and yes he's moving away and he didn't tell her but you know she's upset about it but then as soon as she realizes that she can get fujiyama's record and do this thing she wants to do something for him and and uh, you know do a grand gesture um so it's it's not like he has to go and find a way to make it up to her. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's kind of nice. It shows that she's like already, you know, forgiven him and wants to do something for him and wants to kind of finish the thing that they started together. Well, I think that she Maybe knows. Maybe I should bump it up to a nine. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think that she knows that he feels badly about not telling her because as soon as she's like, well, I guess take care. You know, he just starts crying as he puts his headphones back on. And that starts, was really sad, too. Yeah, he starts I think crying I his eyes out. Oh. And like, she can he definitely hear that because he was sobbing. He must. Yeah, she must have. Yeah. So I think, I mean, yeah. So she knows and she knows that it's like not his decision to be doing it. But he even says, like, I, sh- I should have told you. But, you know. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take it up to a nine. Well, I'm taking it up to a 9.5. <laughs> we're gonna do this game until we're both at 11 <laughs> no we're not we're not giving this an 11 <laughs> fuck you i'll give it a 11 <laughs> i'll give uh, it a 9.3 9.3 okay <laughs> so 9.3 and a 9 <laughs> Uh yeah. Well, if you love it so much, write a haiku about it right now. I don't know what the structure is of a haiku off the top of my head. <laughs> it's like six nine. I think, it's, I think six. six nine. <laughs> oh fuck! I think it's five seven five. Actually, that sounds really correct. Why yeah. did you know that? I'm a poet. You think you've been writing poetry for a long time? I've been writing it since the day I was. Born. <laughs> Any hoozles. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is 575. Well, that's been our episode <laughs> on, on... Words bubble up like soda pop. Soda pop, soda pop, soda pop. Why that? <laughs> an echo. <laughs> Just... Thank you for listening to this episode. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where we put all of our video content clips and fun stuff sometimes we do some youtube specific video content uh if you're not down to see what we look like and see all the cool clips that we put on top of this video podcast i mean more power to you there's audio versions of the podcast you know you can listen to it on apple Podcasts. rate and review on that too please we've got like 
very few ratings. <laughs> That's true. There's not a ton of ratings. Yeah, give us a five star, please. And you know, if you don't fuck with Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify as well, and wherever podcasts are streaming. Blah 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 blah. Uh, you can reach out to us at the Anime Movie Podcast at gmail dot com and on Instagram at the Anime Movie Podcast. Think that wraps everything up. Thank you for listening. Again, subscribe to all of the channels. I'll redo this whole fucking plug if you guys don't subscribe. Okay, I will keep doing it until you subscribe. On YouTube, the anime movie podcast. <laughs> That's where all our clips are. Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star review. Spotify, everywhere podcast streaming. Thanks for listening. See you guys. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Anime Movie Podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at the Anime Movie Podcast, and you can reach out via email at the Anime Movie Podcast at gmail.com. Please subscribe, rate, and review, and tell a friend. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye.